Wow. Wow. <laughs> All right, so this is a stark contrast to, to what you're about to see. <laughs> a few days ago, uh, Bob Buhaka uh, offered to answer questions that uh, we, the, uh, the casting community out on YouTube, might have. Uh, I asked you for questions. You guys responded with a ton of questions. And Bob has been going through the, the questions um, as they've been coming in. And he shot a video today and uh, to answer your questions about porosity. So um, he sent it to me. Here it is. Can you get a Finlander to find some free time to answer some questions from online subscribers? You're going to have to catch them in the sauna. So at the start of this, it's going to be interesting for you guys to realize that most commercial metal casting facilities don't know much more than the hobbyist. Uh, you spend two or three weeks fiddling around in your garage and uh, you guys are basically at the skill level where most casting, commercial casting facilities operate. It's a complete preposterous joke. This industry is, is hilarious. It's the only reason I got into this industry. Uh, 20 years ago, I was working at a commercial testing laboratory and most of my foundry, uh, most of my clients were foundries rather. And uh, I was just amazed and amused how stupid these people were. And so for me, I figured, hell, I get, get into this industry, get in, get rich and bounce, get the hell out of this place. And so what happens is you spend 20 years doing something and get a little bit obsessed about it. And uh, it's fascinating enough, the entire industry hasn't taken a step forward really at all in, in these 20 years. So what I'm gonna take care of uh, in this first sweat session here um, is there's a, there's a bunch of questions regarding um, a few different features that all roll together. So let me tell you what I saw in the thread. So someone asked about uh, furnace conditions regarding uh, gas fuel ratios, whether or not that affects the melt, uh, whether or not gases get into the melt, that type of thing. Um, second is degassing technique. What do you do? Do you have to worry about it? Do you have to use fluxes, powders, gases? What do you do with any of that kind of thing? Um, and then the question then relates to how does that, um, how is that observed as porosity in the final casting and what does that mean? And interestingly enough, they're all, they're all the exact same questions. So I'm going to run through it like this. So right now, if you're using any kind of fuel based furnace, fuel based cru crucible furnace to melt your metal, you've got fuel and you've got air, which is your oxygen source. You're mixing the two together. So you've got heat, which is the spark. You've got a fuel source, which is your fuel and your oxygen. Now, when you put that oxygen fuel uh, ratio together, if you create a reducing flame, meaning you don't have enough oxygen to burn off all the fuel, what happens is the byproducts of incomplete combustion, water vapor, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and also some hydrocarbons, right? Which of course is the, the carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Now, what you want is an oxidizing flame, right? So you want the flame to have complete combustion, the byproducts of combustion evaporate into the air, the surface of your milk is fine. The idea being that if you have a reducing flame, that when you've got just above the surface of the metal is hydrocarbon, moisture-rich air that then can absorb down into the metal, right? Maybe partially true. But before we get into any of this, there's something that's really important to understand. And it's really simple physics. Um, you'll be able to understand it, no problem whatsoever. And we're going to walk through it this way. You take a block of ingot. Let's just say we're using aluminum now. Um, so we've got a block of ingot, it's aluminum. Inside of that ingot are a whole bunch of atoms. Those atoms are arranged in crystalline structure, right? In a crystalline solid structure. Now, as you raise the temperature, temperature is average kinetic energy, what happens is the atoms start to vibrate. Faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. So turn off your furnace now, and now we're losing temperature, we're losing average kinetic energy, and we lock into place as a crystal, right? So let's speed that back up. Let's crank our furnace back up. So now the atoms are vibrating, and we're adding average kinetic energy by adding temperature. And we get to the point now where the crystals break, right? And so now we've got these atoms floating around in an amorphous melt, 
floating everywhere. And the higher the temperature, meaning the higher the average kinetic energy, the further and further these atoms get. Now, when the atoms get far apart because of the increase in temperature, because of the increase in average kinetic energy, what happens is now diatomic gases can fit in interstitially in between these atoms. Now, let's imagine we've got a melt and we're fully liquid, right? And we've got millions and millions and millions and millions and billions and billions of these atoms floating around. And there's diatomic gases in here now and they're all floating around. So now we start to cool. So the cooling phase works this way. We have a lack of temperature, a loss of temperature, a decrease in average kinetic energy. And so now this amorphous atomic structure starts getting closer and closer and closer. And as it's getting closer, what's happening now is any diatomic gases that are trapped in between those atoms, they're getting ejected. So they're being ejected in advance of the solidification front. And so what happens is we get closer, 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 locked into place, right? that ejected diatomic gas now gets pushed forward into that advancing liquid, meaning that in the last remaining liquid metal, most of the diatomic ga gases got pushed there by the advancing solidification front. Really important to keep in mind. Now, why does this matter? There's another fascinating phenomenon that takes place during that solidification time, exactly the same time that the diatomic gases are being ejected, and that is the presence of the oxide bifilm. Now, the oxide bifilm, you get in a few different ways. Number one, the, the oxide biofilm forms and starts at the top of the surface. You've got your molten metal in your crucible, you're melting it down, the molten metal is exposed to air. The air is reacting with the molten metal to bring it back to its natural state. All of our engineering alloys, every single one of them, every engineering material used by man is a temporal, metastable misfit of nature. And I repeat, it's a temporal, metastable misfit of nature. They're not natural materials. We extract them from the dirt. We mix them together to find some kind of usable properties. And then we freeze or lock it into place with quenching and heat treating and these types of things. But they're only temporary. They can all be uh, undone. And given time, they're all gonna go back to dirt, right? So all we're doing now is we're adding the kinetic energy and increasing that reaction time by having this metal molten exposed to the air, immediately at that interface, that material changes. Now, here's the thing that people miss all of the time. This oxide bifilm, which grows off of this melt, is in perfect atomic contact with the melt. Meaning that in your mind, if you could pick up the melt itself, the liquid, the oxide film would stick to it because it's part of it. It's part of that matrix now. It grew atomically off of it. It's in perfect atomic contact with it. The top side is dry, right? Perfectly dry, perfectly inert. It's like electrical tape, right? Um, but that backside is sticky. It's stuck to the metal. Now, as that metal rolls in, that surface rolls in on itself with any kind of surface turbulence, that's where we get the name bifilm, right? Like a bicycle. Right? So this oxide film starts, rolls in on itself, and invariably traps a little bit of air. Right? Now that whole thing gets crumpled up, pulled into the melt. Now we've got air in your melt as well. So now we've got a pre-existing crack with a bubble of air in it in a compacted form, which is what we call a furled oxide film. And they go rifling through the melt. It happens again at the surface and again and again and again and again with all of the surface turbulence that's taking place. Now the other place this happens is in the running system. And of course, when we're talking about the running system, the areas that matter the very most are the areas with the highest velocity. Because with the highest velocity, we have the highest kinetics for reaction. So it's the sprue bottom and the runner transition, and we get any kind of turbulence there, even small little problems whatsoever, you mess up the metal, terrible. And now you aspirate air bubbles again, and now you aspirate um, atmospheric air. Yeah, uh, 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 sorry, you uh, aspirate sand, that kind of shit. Anyways, okay, so now, now you've got this furled oxide film rifling through your metal and up into your casting cavity. And so now, just like we talked about how these atoms are in this amorphous state, in this amorphous state, you also have these compacted furled oxide films with a little bit of air on the inside, right? Now, as solidification starts, the reason why solidification starts is, imagine my hand is the mold wall, and imagine that this is the atom, right? And so here is our vibration, here's our motion, and as we bang into the mold wall, the mold wall takes away some of that energy. That's what cooling is, right? And so now we get to the point where 
this metal locks into place and we get slow tree-like grain-like structures growing off of this mold wall out. As this solidification front starts and progresses, it pushes forward the oxide film. Pushes it forward, pushes it forward, and you can imagine now from the top, from the side, from the bottom. So at the center of mass, we get both all of the ejected diatomic gases and a vast majority of the collection of unfurled oxide films. Now the unfurled oxide films, like I said, have a little bit of air in them. So what happens now is the diatomic gases that were pushed into the center of solidification from, they diffuse into the oxide film, the air inside the oxide film, and that starts to open up the oxide film, creating a planar crack in your matrix, right? This is a crack. Almost all porosity that you see in a casting, it's not the gas, it's the bifilm. If you have these diatomic gases being ejected into the matrix, into the metallic matrix, and there's no oxide films, you don't get porosity. It doesn't happen, right? So now that we talk about this, you're gonna realize really quickly that if we take some really careful attention to how we handle the metal and design our running system, we're going to be able to avoid porosity even if our quote unquote gas levels are high, right? So for the steel folks and people pouring coppers, you really only care about oxygen. People pouring aluminum, hydrogen. But really, we don't give a damn anyways. So let's talk about what the degassing process is. So the degassing process is this. You've got your crucible after your tap, full of metal, before you clean it. The industry believes that what they do is they're gonna do some kind of degassing practice. They're gonna remove gases. It's not what's happening, right? What we're really doing is we're creating a flotation mechanism to get the oxide films out of the melt. So what happens is in industry right now, imagine this is your crucible. What industry does is they lower down a rotor. The rotor spins and at the bottom of the rotor, um, at the bottom of the shaft, there's a rotor. The gas, which is either argon or nitrogen, goes down the shaft, the bubbles come out, they start coming back up. On the way back up, they get chopped by this rotor, chop, 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 chop. And it makes millions and millions and millions of little uh, gas bubbles. The idea is that the gas bubbles are raising up, raising up, raising up, and they're capturing any of these suspended oxide films and floating them out to the surface. And then we're gonna skim them off. Industry believes that the gas bubbles are going up and joining with other gas bubbles and they're having like a gas bubble dance party and they race to the surface. It's, it's poppy cop, it's crazy. So the easiest way for you guys to degas your metals in your garage is by either argon or nitrogen, a little cylinder, get a copper tube, lower it down to the bottom of the, the crucible, maybe uh, for you guys, I don't know, you're doing baby stuff, say maybe an inch off the bottom of the crucible floor, turn on the gas just a little bit and let the bubbles come up, right? There's foundries to this day that still use a potato to degas. Let me tell you what I mean by this. So they'll take a piece of rebar and they'll grab a potato and stick it at the end and plunge that into the metal. What happens then is the moisture comes out of the potato and it bubbles up, right? And so what happens is the bubbles pull up these oxide films to the surface and they skim them off and you know they, they think that's what they're doing. They think they're doing some kind of degassing technique. You don't need any of that stuff. Now, here's the thing to worry about when it comes to the argon or the nitrogen that you're gonna use for the degassing. Your compressed gases has have water vapor in them, right? You, you'll notice the purity is 99.6, 99.4, 99.5, even the best ones, right? 99 point not, 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 still got water vapor. So now as the bubble's coming in, to get rid of these floating oxide films, you're adding new oxide films. So it's tricky that way, but for you guys, you're making widgets. It, it's, it's really not gonna be that big of a deal. Here's the real key, right? You want to take care to prevent any kind of surface turbulence whatsoever. When you're pouring the metal, and I'm gonna teach you guys the calculations on how to make sure you get your taper just perfectly. As metal is falling, just like any liquid falls, what happens is a vena contracta forms. Actually here, let me show you. Watch the water fall, right? You're gonna notice that the taper See how thick it is at the top and how narrow it is at the bottom? That is due to gravitational acceleration. You have a consistent volumetric flow rate, and as the liquid is falling through the air, gravity is accelerating it. And it's accelerating it at 386 inches per second per second. So what happens now is since the volumetric uh, flow rate is consistent, the stream has to taper. Right? You've all seen this taper when your wife asks you to paint the kitchen yellow or some shit. And so, you know, you're pouring the paint and hating your life and wishing you could just go outside and play with the dogs, but you gotta paint the fucking kitchen yellow. Anyways, so 
you want that metal now to travel down and create a metal over air system. What happens with all of the systems that you guys are doing now is as you're pouring, not only do you have surface turbulence at the start, but you're aspirating air in a few different ways. Number one, you're aspirating air through the conical pouring cup. There's videos on my LinkedIn channel showing that. So now the metal's entering and sucking air instantly. As it travels through an unfilled runner, what happens is there's depressurized areas and that creates an aspiration mechanism. And now here's the real key that almost nobody gets. The air that you're aspirating in starts off at this size. If you're pouring aluminum, that exact same amount of air turns into this amount of air. If you're pouring coppers, it turns into this amount of air. And if you're pouring ferrous alloys, it turns into this amount of air because the gases expand, the air expands as it heats up. So you start with a little bit of air, but you get a whole bunch more, right? Now, here's the other issue. Now, as your metal's traveling through the running system, any opportunity it has to traverse through an unfilled runner, what happens now is you're pressurizing and depressurizing that channel because now there's an interaction with air with the binder and you're creating problems, right? You're giving an opportunity for things to get in. So what you need is the metal needs to leave the ladle, hit the basin, travel the sprue, instantly the system's full. What you're creating now is a metal over air system and pushing that air ahead. Now that air that's being pushed ahead, that's gotta go somewhere. Because if you don't, you can imagine down at the runner and this is why the use of runner extensions is horrible. What happens is you get a bunch of back pressure built up, but it isn't the back pressure of the air that's there. It's this much runner extension, this much air, this much air now from just that little mitt in just seconds right and then what happens is it builds back pressure the metal poof it rockets up into your casting cavity screws it up creates a jet uh, you know empties out it's absolutely horrendous so i'm going to review and get this sweaty video over quick number one for your furnace, make sure that your oxygen and fuel ratio is right. You want a re an oxidizing flame, not a reducing flame. The easiest way to check to make sure that you've got an oxidizing flame, take a piece of pure zinc, put it at your flame. If it turns bluish, purplish, you're oxidizing, you're good to go. That's a good little trick that a lot of foundries use. Number two, uh, fill system design. So you gotta get the pour, pouring cup just right, the sprue calculation, the sprue taper, the sprue runner, transition perfect we're gonna get all those calculations I'm gonna walk it through it give you guys a formula that's gonna make it easy 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 um, porosity almost everything that you think is shrink is an unfurled oxide film almost everything gases in your casting only matter if you have a heavy presence of unfurled oxide films without unfurled oxide films the gases do nothing nothing they are just there Here's another point. The air that you're aspirating during your filling also has water vapor, right? From the humidity in the air. And so now not only do you have to deal with the expanding air, but you have to deal with the expanding water vapor as well. So it is, metal casting is really, really easy. It's really easy, man. You, you take some dirt, you refine it, you turn it into a molten metal. And then we're just going to transfer it without letting it turn back into dirt and without letting air bubbles get in. It's crazy easy. The physics are simple. Half of this stuff, um, after, you know, reading John and, you know, being his protege, I, I just sit down at the uh, river fishing with my son, pounding beers, watching the, the water flow, th you know, down the creek and the river. And it, this stuff is simple. Anybody can figure it out. We all have access to it. We all have the same brain power. We just got to use it, untrain our brains. And the biggest thing is, you can take my advice or not. I, I don't really care because I don't. Even, this shit's just just fun for me. So listen, this is the way that I see it, anyways. And who am I? I'm God's gift to metal casting. XXO. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> good stuff. Actually, very good stuff. Hopefully, you guys watched the whole thing. Hopefully you learn from it. Uh, I know I'm still learning and um, a lot to think about, but it makes sense. Everything, I think everything he said made sense. So if you haven't watched the whole thing, go back and do it. And have a great day.